Hello and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us for the fourth and final of our Quantum Materials Seminar Series this month. It's great to see so many people here and thank you for coming. Um, to those who haven't met me yet, my name is Helena and I am the Quantum Materials Outreach Officer here in the Department of Physics. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Matthew Steggles, who is our final speaker for this series. Uh, Matthew is a DFIL student here in the department. Um, if you can't remember from the last couple of seminars, DFIL is basically what Oxford calls a PhD. Um, and he is interested in quantum nanoscience. So that's all about using quantum mechanics in future technologies and also figuring out how this, these future technologies can help inform us about these quantum mechanical properties. Um, and so he's going to tell us a little bit today about frontiers in computing, both on the classical side and the quantum computing side. So I will now hand over to Matthew. So over the show. Hi, cool. I'm, I'm, I'm Matthew. I'm, I'm a PhD student, as Helena said. Uh, one of the things I'm most interested in, uh, there we go, everyone can see that, right? One of the things I'm most interested in, in condensed matter and quantum matter, is the influence it can have on technology. Um, so we already saw in Alexi's talk, she really fantastically mentioned at the end what she called using magnonics, these, these magnon waves, to come up with ingenious new methods of doing computing. And I'm gonna be talking about two separate things. So firstly, one approach that my research is largely based on, on improving ways that we do classical computing, and one, a slightly exotic way of getting around some of the problems in quantum computing. Um, obviously, what this talk is not going to be is a comprehensive introduction to either of those things. I'm sorry, there just wouldn't be enough time. I've got some links, however, to particularly on the quantum side. I know lots of people are quite interested in this. So I've got some recommended YouTube videos. So if you guys are interested, I do give those a watch afterwards. So beginning, is that working? Uh -huh, cool. Oh, I've got a nice pointer. So, you know, you, it, I won't have failed to notice that computers are absolutely everywhere in our lives. You, you are almost certainly on one right now, unless you're watching me through my window. Um, pocket on your desk, on your wrist, maybe even in your fridge, if you have one of those horrible, horrible Samsung smart fridges that shouldn't exist. But the two obvious questions that no doubt you're interested in are how can we make them better and perhaps how can we change things up completely? So how can we make them better is the first section we talk about more efficient, perhaps quite interesting ways of doing classical computing. And secondly, this methods for more robust quantum computing. So moving on to the first section, just uh, some of the ideas of classical computing. So the basic idea is really old. It's almost 200 years old, started by Charles Babbage, who if everything's, yeah, this guy in the top right corner. Sorry, I've got a bunch of faces. There we go. Um, he came up with a design for an entirely mechanical computer that we now recognize would have been literally a computer. It would work in exactly the same way. Um, but our modern ones, at least, the fundamental building block is something called a transistor. This is a three terminal electrical component. So in your electronics classes, you'll come across things like resistors, maybe a capacitor with two leads. These happen to have three. And when we, when we hear ones and zeros, when we think about computers calculated with ones and zeros, it's, this is the basis of that. And you can think of it as being basically just like a water pipe, where the source here is where the water comes in, the gate is a valve that adjusts the flow rate, and the drain is where the current comes out. And this arrow shows they can go only, only pass through one direction. So the gain, if the gain is sensitive enough, and that's how, quickly this opens or closes in response to a current, we can turn this into an on or off switch. And that is the one and zero inside a computer. And the really genius circuitry happens when we start connecting the drain into the gate of something else so that this thing being off can then determine whether something else can turn off and on and so on. You can see how this gets really complicated. And, and this is basically the basis of all computing at the moment. So obviously, these things are important and we probably need quite a lot of them. So, oops, there we go, there we go. How small can we make one? Uh, so ignoring anything really, really specific, there's a couple other important problems. Um, the smaller they are, the more of them we can put on a, on a little chip and broadly speaking, the faster we can make it. 
Um, now these things are bloody tiny at the moment. The smallest that you can commercially buy are the AMD ones, that's seven nanometers across. So a nanometer is one billionth of a meter, a thousandth of a thousandth of a thousandth of a meter. Seven, and the, uh, in these sorts of school talks, the ubiquitous unit is the thickness of a human hair, always. It's uh, one ten thousandth in human hair units. Um, and these things are made, this, this diagram here from Wikipedia, they're sort of assembled layer by layer. These layers will be evaporated or deposited on. Um, they're made from very, very high purity silicon with engineered impurities. So they get it really, really clean and then add in specific amounts. Uh, these are called dopants. They will be things like typically boron and phosphorus. These two are really, really important. Um, there'll be what's called N and P type. The uh, N type has excess electrons and the P type has not enough electrons. And that's what allows us to do all the interesting things. But uh, talk's not on that, anyway. Um, so they're made of silicon with engineered impurities. That's the important thing. So how small can we make it? What's the smallest thing we could possibly think of that we could make? And, you know, what about one atom? Let's be ridiculous here. Let's go to the smallest sort of reasonable building block of matter. Th this, is, this has some issues. It's unfortunately just too small. Um, it's not complex enough to engineer. So what we want is we want some sort of geometric complexity. Atoms are pretty much spherically symmetrical. There's no sides and these electronic devices, you can convince yourself it might be quite useful to have some sort of asymmetry in the way that they work. And you need to have that in the device. Um, and they're just too small to connect up. You can't attach a wire to an atom. Uh, three angstroms uh, 0.3 nanometers. So this is perhaps um, about a 25th of the size of current transistors. It's just too small. So, okay, move, moving on to the important bit. Got this graph here of saying a commercial transistor is about 10 nanometers. One atom is 0.1 nanometers. That's too small. So what about here? What about a molecule? And so a molecule, as we know, made of large collections of atoms, that's big enough that we can engineer all sorts of complicated shapes and architectures into it. And this prompts sort of the birth of a field called molecular electronics. There we go, excuse the horrible word up. Um, so why would we want to do this? Um, the first concept of it is almost 50 years old now. Um, Avram and Ratner pointed out that, so I mentioned earlier that the silicon in, a, in a, a transistor is very similar to that in a diode. This is called an NP junction. This just, just imagine these as two chunks of silicon with different impurities in them. Um, and this is a diode, which is another electrical component that is, you know, a bit like a, a, a very simplified version of part of the transistor. It's an important model. Um, and they pointed out that this molecule on the right hand side should behave exactly the same way because this P type section and this section with the nitrogen on it can both accept extra electrons. And this section with the sulfur and this N type doping can donate electrons. This turns out to be exactly what we'd need. Um, and so every single thing that we'd want to do with electronics and semiconductors, we could do with single molecules in principle. This is, this is actually amazing. Even a very large complicated molecule is five nanometers. So we're already, even just the largest molecules you'd reasonably want to use, we're already smaller. And they're very, very thin. You could imagine that you could stack them much more densely. Um, as Alexi mentioned in her talk, actually the biggest problem right now in classical computing is dealing with the tremendous amount of heat caused by powering all of these transistors. Um, and these have scope to be even more energy efficient. Uh, something, and another thing that perhaps is less important for computing, but I'm very interested in as a researcher, is that they are what we call mesoscopic. They are just the right size, that you've got lots and lots of atoms interacting together and that gives you some rather beautiful quantum mechanics to have a look for some rather exotic phenomena. So I did some back of the envelope calculations for what you could expect if you imagine you're 
your molecular smartphone in your pocket. You can have 25 times denser transistors on the board. So if we could solve the heat problem, which molecules stand a good chance of doing, you could have just 25 times higher clock speeds. And the most dramatic one is, is the storage density. If you could uh, come up with a, you sort of, there's some various estimates you come up with, but some ridiculous numbers, you could get anywhere from a million to a trillion times more data on the same chip. Your, your smartphone, instead of its memory being measured in the gigabytes, could be in the thousands of terabytes, which is astonishing. So why aren't we all doing this already? This, this sounds fantastic. And the, the answer is, answer is hard. It's really hard. There's no such thing as nanometer tweezers, rather unfortunate. It would make my job an awful lot easier if there were. Um, so how do we make a gap three nanometers across? How do we put something in it crucially? And how do we make interesting chemicals like this? This looks fairly complicated, right? So the first one, fantastic, solved, not my problem. Leave it to chemists. But the first two, this is a physics engineering problem and this is part of my job. Um, our research group in Oxford, um, I can't claim at all anything to do with this solution, but we work with some fantastic biophysicists and they've come up with an ingenious method using something called DNA origami. Now, you'll have all learned from your biology classes that DNA is basically this long polymer of organic molecules. Um, and each of these has an A, T, C or G and each can only bond to one other thing. Um, our sort of biotechnology is at the point where we can essentially specify a huge length of this DNA and this specificity in how it can fold means that we can turn it into scaffolding. We can leave it and it'll automatically fold itself up. And so this is actually the design that we use when we're doing this. We have two gold nano beads which are large here but they're 60 nanometers across, a huge bit of DNA and this is our molecule. So what happens is the DNA folds up into this big scaffolding. It looks a bit like a cube with two pyramids cut out of it. And then the gold nanoparticles slot onto the ends here. And we're end, we end up with a 3D structure that looks a bit like this. And sure enough, here's one I made earlier. So as soon as we've built this structure, this structure is now big enough for us to use the conventional methods. And the conventional methods are the ones that we used for making regular semiconductor products like computers. Um, and right in the middle of there, you can't see it. It's an electron microscope and DNA doesn't show up under electron microscopes, I'm afraid. Um, should be a single molecule, I think, if I've got the right chip. Um, which is amazing. Uh, so if you want a sense of scale for how big this picture is, um, my pen. So the tip of my pen here. It's probably about a millimetre. If you held my pen over here, it would be 200 metres across. These, these things are minuscule. Um, so cool, that's, that's the first half of a little chat about molecular electronics. Um, so on to the next bit, which I'm sure you're excited for, is the quantum section. So like I mentioned at the beginning, there's just far too much for me to talk about here for me to actually give an introduction to the field, um, which is really sad. But I really recommend at least these two videos and there's loads of really good ones these days. Um, so these wired ones explaining in, in several levels of difficulty, these are really good if you're just starting out learning something because the more difficult ones will make reference to the earlier ones and you can sort of check back and watch the different ones and make sure you understand everything. And my talk is going to be largely inspired by one that Steve Simon, who's a professor at Oxford, gave a few years ago at the TEDx conference in Oxford. So when we are doing quantum computing, the gist I'll go into is, is that, you know, we're not using ones and zeros, but as superpositions. These are called qubits. I won't go into why these are the thing to do, but they are. The unfortunate thing when you're engineering these sorts of things is that they're very, very fragile. When you've prepared a qubit, it's quite liable to, in response to any heat, any magnetic fields at all, or anything like that, to collapse back into just ones and zeros, and the entire point is, is ruined. You can see this 
represents a little bit of heat coming in and this is a dilution fridge where quantum computers are normally put and oh there we go it's, it's a trash can it's garbage um so what i'm going to be talking about is a way of maybe getting around this no one knows yet but it seems quite cool unfortunately we're going to have to have a bit of a mathematical diversion first so fasten your seat belts and we go into the world of knot theory so what on earth could knots have to do with computers? And um, hopefully the next five minutes or so, I'll convince you that this is at least something that we might want to think about. So a knot invariant is a function, which again, if you're unfamiliar, that's just a mathematical machine. We can put in a knot or a link like this, and it will spit out a number or a mathematical expression, and normally it'll be a polynomial. Five minutes, okay, cool. Um, so what do we want out of this machine? Um, what we want is it to be immune to wiggles. So anytime we put in a link like this, it doesn't matter if we garble this up or fold this edge over, it'll be the same thing. And it should be unique, it should be specific. If we put in a different knot like this trefoil, it should not be the same thing as this. Um, and there's an infinite number of these, but I'm gonna, with these definitions, just assume that this works. So, Okay, cool, so what? So two amazing facts is that firstly, computations, the mathematical statement of what's happening inside a computer can be encoded into a knot. There is a sensible way of writing your program as a knot, which is strange. This is normally interesting, but kind of useless because it's actually exponentially hard to calculate. If your knot crosses itself n times, you need to do two to the n calculations. That's bad. But two, there are certain exotic quantum systems whose state when measured depends on the paths they've taken beforehand. So what, sorry, what does this mean? It means that when we get some particles, make them wrap around each other, their state at the end depends on what we did to them before and how we wrap them around each other. So in other words, how we've knotted them. So this is an experiment. We imagine we have some of the particles that I've talked about, and we'll call them one, two, three, four. Um, so what we're gonna do is at, at some time one, we create particles one and two and three and four at points A and B. At time two, we just wrap two around number three like that. And at three, we recombine them. And so what I've just told you is that the state that these particles end up at the end depends on the windings that they've taken. And mathematically, by a small miracle, it turns out that for some of these systems, it's exactly the same as calculating the knot invariant. But that's the thing that I just told you is incredibly hard for classical computers to do. So deep breath, we'll gather our thoughts because there's been a lot of seemingly disconnected ideas here, is that one, a knot invariant is a sensible thing to do to a knot. Two, calculating it is the same thing as running a computer program. But this is hard, so no one cares. But some exotic quantum systems automatically calculate this or something related to it by weird quantum magic. It turns out that this is equivalent, sort of, to quantum computing. There are some caveats. So, and again, the next level of why do we care is that this is the very same, very reason that we'd want to do it because it's resistant to the errors. Let me show you. So when I said the knot invariant is immune to wiggles, that was this heat coming in. And remember at the beginning, we had the heat coming into the quantum computer and destroying the calculation. But here, because we're doing something completely different, all that happens is we wiggle the particle. We've not caused any crossings or wrappings around. And so actually the same thing happens. We measure exactly the same thing in the presence of the heap or not. And this is the amazing thing. We are immune in this scheme to the errors that normal quantum computing can suffer from. So that's pretty cool. So why aren't we all doing this? This is extremely hard to observe is the problem, is that 
firstly, there are some sensible ways in conventional quantum computing of trying to get around these problems. Okay, thanks, Helena. Um, and unfortunately, the most reasonable platforms for doing this experimentally, turns out you can't calculate what would happen for any computer program. You have to supplement it with extra bits. Uh, and there's, there's large groups of quite sensible people who aren't 100% sure that these, these exotic systems exist. But that doesn't mean we're not trying. Um, researchers and industry as well, Microsoft Station Q is an entire Microsoft industrial complex that have dedicated their time to building one of these quantum systems, which is called a topological quantum computer. So we've, we've expanded our brains a bit in the past 20 minutes with some, some nonsense ideas. Um, so let, let me quote, and uh, sorry, uh, it's, uh, it's always good to take stock and think why we're we doing this. Um, the outlook is, is that classical and quantum computing have been around for quite a while now, very well established hundreds of genius people and hundreds of genius ideas, but we're always looking for new creative solutions, something completely sideways, something completely different. And there's a chance if either of these two things catch on that in a hundred years time, computing could be extremely different. Finishing with this quote to sum this up from Hamlet, if you know your Shakespeare, is there are more things in heaven and earth than exist in your philosophy. And we'll just try to ignore the fact that Shakespeare wrote this to foreshadow Hamlet having a mental breakdown. So thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of my whistle stop tour of molecular electronics and topological quantum computing. Uh, move on to the questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Matthew, for that, like you say, whistle stop tour through some yeah. ideas in modern day computing. That's fantastic. Um, brilliant. So let's move on to some questions. So we've had a few coming in already, but make sure to get your questions in, in the Q&A thing, if you have any. Um, so we'll start with the top upvoted question here, which is asking about quantum tunneling effects in Ooh. transistors. So they ask, wouldn't quantum tunneling still allow electrons to flow across the transistor after it's off? So would that impose a limit on how small the transistor can get? Basically, yes, uh, this, is a, this is a problem sometimes. Um, with very, very small uh, junctions, then yeah, tunneling can occur in between the, the electrodes. Um, fortunately, tunneling is a very, very small effect. Um, okay, so firstly, I'm not a semiconductor physicist. There are some subtleties to this. Um, but when you want to observe tunneling in the lab, it's quite reassuring. You actually have to try really hard to see it. It's generally quite a small effect, but you're totally right, it does happen. And this leakage current is something that people do think about. Nice, okay, brilliant. So that answers that about quantum tunneling. Um, let's find another one here. <laughs> Got people wondering why you said smart fridges are evil, but... Um, I don't why do you need it? You don't <laughs> need it. <laughs> Anyway, how do you um, want Samsung to spy on your groceries? <laughs> um, there you go. That's one question. Cool. <laughs> brilliant. Um, so another question, um, thinking about the knots. So what is actually happening when you say you knot B and C around each other? So there's several layers to this. Um, when I say not B and C around each other, I mean I have two objects and I go like that. Um, the way that actually this does have an effect on what we measure at the end is unfortunately caused by some very, very complicated quantum mechanics. And But you can get a sense for... So even when I did this, notice my arm wrapped around the top of my pen. And so the configuration was not actually the same thing as truly knotting them around each other. Um, and, you know, if you can believe that something like this is possible. It, it's, it's not perhaps unreasonable to think that having a truly topologically distinct path might, through some magic, give you something different. I'm sorry I can't give you a more detailed answer than that. That's definitely something to um, look into further if you're interested, I guess. <laughs> right, um, so another question. Speaking of looking into things further. We've got a question here asking for any good book recommendations. Good books. I was, I was told to expect this question. Um, good books. I'm afraid I don't really know any that are at exactly the right level. But I, like I said at the beginning, 
back here, I really do recommend at least these two and YouTube videos are nowadays getting pretty good at explaining things like this. These are both about the quantum things. So Steve is much better at, you know, he, he actually works specifically on this. So he'll, he'll explain it a bit better than me and he takes a bit longer as well. And this video is pretty good as well. You know, watch, watch things related to this. And I think hopefully that'll, that'll help out. Brilliant. Thank you for those recommendations. Cool. So back to a couple of questions. Um, so one here asking, why isn't DNA visible on an electron microscope? Why is that? Right. Um, basically, OK, so it, it could be. It, it just turns out that um, electrons obviously are charged. Um, and this charging and the electrostatic effects turns out it means that actually the most high contrast materials are metals and conductors. Uh, this here is gold. All of this is made of gold, uh, which is extremely conductive. It's very, very conductive. So basically what happens is that um, the contrast in an SEM comes from the conducting areas. DNA is a pretty good electrical insulator. It's very, very good, actually. So that's why it doesn't show up, because it doesn't conduct. Nice. Nice answer. Um, cool. Another question. So thinking back to qubits, um, where you're saying Absolutely. things like heat and, and stuff can perturb them and, and basically kill them, essentially. Um, does radioactivity have the same effect? Does that affect qubits too? It certainly could. Absolutely. I see why not. If, if you stuck a piece of uranium next to a qubit and a big gamma particle came out and shot your qubit, that would certainly do something bad. Um, you, is it something that we need to consider, you know, with the natural background radiation? Do you think that's enough to... Oh, I have no idea. Um, I don't tend that to do... That was a question from me there, sorry. <laughs> um, I don't tend to do qubit experiments. Hmm. Hopefully not. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, so often you'll be inside a, a fridge when I say fridge for the audience, or I mean like a lab fridge that goes down to like almost absolute zero. Um, and you'll be in a sort of pumped out dilute environment. So actually there's not really much air around. So I'd imagine probably not. Cool. If you want to Google that, maybe, maybe someone else has thought about this. Um, nice. Cool. So basically qubits are incredibly fragile and the slightest little perturbation will just completely mess them up sure. sometimes like they, they, they they're not they're not terrible <laughs> and like i said there's there's hundreds of, of genius people like working mm -hmm. on amazing ways of stabilizing things correcting the errors and things like that it's... absolutely absolutely um someone here asking has have a has a molecular transistor um have they actually been built and used in computers or is it just kind of theoretical or experimental cool well, well it's, they've been built, it's experimental. Um, so our results aren't quite ready, but people have certainly done this. We're, so it's been done for the past couple of years. Uh, the, the approach that I mentioned with the DNA origami is, uh, no one else has done that, but there's actually lots of other ways that you can do it. Um, so molecular transistors uh, do certainly exist. And currently they're, more focused on research lab based things, people interested in studying quantum mechanical effects inside rather than commercial applications. But the past five, 10 years have seen a real tipping point that we're starting to see people coming up with ways of producing more than one at a time. Uh, and that, you know, in perhaps another 10, 20 years could tip the way to seeing specialized molecular devices inside. Uh, one of the things people say they could be useful for is in sort of flexible medical technology um, devices. So nothing commercial, just research at the moment, but it's possible. Excellent. Okay, so this is a good one, kind of springboarding off the discussion of qubits we we're having a bit earlier. Um, would qubits have to operate at near absolute zero if they are disturbed by heat? So basically, probably. Um, Conventional methods, certainly. Um, well, okay, so there's, there's the main ways of doing things. There's either what we call superconducting quantum qubits, and these do have to work very, very cold. So firstly, they work on superconductors, so you have to be below the superconducting temperature. But 
even below that, you need to make sure that none of this heat can destroy your calculations. Um, there's other types called with like single atom um, laser quantum computing by using like laser pulses to excite ga dilute gases. Those can be done typically at lab temperature, but they're technically very, very cold because they're so dilute. Um, topological quantum computing could, for the same reasons that I've, I've mentioned, heat is temperature, right? You could potentially operate at ever so slightly higher temperatures, but I think it would, due to, because remember when I said how most of the sensible experimental approaches, you'd need to supplement it with some of the classical way, the or normal quantum computing ways. Um, it seems like it'd be a pretty good idea to keep it cold anyway. Fair enough. Brilliant. So there's quite a few questions going back to thinking about the molecular electronics now. So we'll go back Absolutely. to the classical side of things. Absolutely. Um, so there's a question here asking, how would you arrange or layer these molecular transistors? So how would you actually arrange them together? How would I? Um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> or how would one arrange them? Do you know? You know, I'm, I'm actually not entirely sure. I, I think, so basically because they can be black boxed into, into this design that we've got a source and a drain. Um, and essentially, basically, once you've got um, something like this, if you just apply an electric field sideways, that's essentially the same thing as a gate, it turns out. Um, so because we can write it as being basically a source, a drain and a gate, you could probably more or less use the architectures that are used for current semiconductor computers. I'm sure if you could come up with a very good way of doing that, there'd, there'd be a, a big prize and a, and a career in that. <laughs> so that's the thing with this cutting edge research. A lot of it is still, we don't really know. We're still trying things out. And yeah, that's it's all probably this, but... <laughs> We don't know, and that's why we need researchers. <laughs> um, brilliant. So there's quite there's a couple of questions kind of asking about the sort of idea that this has been thought of for kind of the past 50 years or so, certainly in the molecular yeah. electronics. So what stopped them from making them back then? Why is it only now that these things are coming to fruition? And the same with quantum computers like when do we think we might have commercially available quantum computers available yeah that's a great those that's a, a great set of, of questions so the molecular electronics um firstly there were several barriers for things like for example the avarum and ratna diode um firstly chemistry is really hard um making an exactly the right molecule that you want is pretty hard i'm not a chemist but i understand that that was a bit of an issue um, and the chemists that I work with coming up with molecules that we want to look at uh, or want to in the future, um, it's really hard. Um, secondly, the engineering point. So remember how I was saying that currently the smallest uh, transistors that you can buy on a, on a computing board are about seven nanometers. That's to do with advances in what's called electron beam lithography techniques and things like that, all of the manufacturing and nano manufacturing techniques we just couldn't make things small enough. We couldn't get it reliably enough. A big problem that people have found in molecular electronics is that the results aren't replicable or reliable. They'll end up with something that is one molecular transistor, but then they'll make a similar device with the same molecule and it won't be the same because the molecule will be kind of in sideways or something like that. So that's what the sort of the barriers that kept people from really looking at this for a really long time. Uh, thankfully, we've got enough of a feel for it at this time that it's, that's beginning to be less of an issue. Um, as for commercial and larger scale quantum computing, so the past five, 10 years have been huge. Um, all of the major computing platforms, Google, Microsoft, and Intel have all invested hugely in quantum computing. Google even claimed quantum supremacy on some calculation, which is a technical term for uh, the point at which a quantum computer was outright completely better than any classical computer could ever be. Um, there's some controversy over, over that claim, I, I won't go into it, but um, it's, you know, I think we're really in a really exciting time. We're right on the brink of stable multi-qubit quantum processing being reasonable to do, not just in a lab. So who knows, you know, 
20, 30 years, you could see specialized quantum computing processes on certain industrial applications. Yeah. Fantastic. Do you think it might end up being like um, nuclear fusion where it's always 20 years in the future, no matter what you ask? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> That's definitely a joke I've heard for probably about the past five or ten years myself. So, um. Yeah, um, um, but well, okay. So the the gist the gist is nature really doesn't want us to make a quantum computer. Um, but you know, I think I think we're getting that. <laughs> nice, nice, um, cool. So on the idea of kind of research and studying we've had a couple of questions kind of asking what's a good way to get into this sort of field so is it is it physics is right. it engineering kind of do you do master's degrees phds kind of Ooh. yeah that is a good question um so actually because of what i was saying about industry opening up there's several several different things um so i did physics i studied physics and then i did a master's in theoretical physics and now i'm doing a phd in experimental physics you can you can jump and chop and change and things it's kind of fine um that's the most conventional thing people who are interested in quantum computing the emphasis is normally on the quantum bit at the moment so it'd be typically like a physics research thing so you'd want to do a degree in physics and then a master's degree in physics and do some research to do with it um however because the past few years have opened up so much, um, you can definitely go into computer science at this point and take quantum computing options, I think. You know, don't go doing that just because I said so. Um, you could even get into information theory and quantum information theory via maths. You could study maths and, and get, get into this. Uh, engineering, I would assume, probably as well. Um, or material science. Material science, they're doing loads of things like this at the moment. Yeah, so it spans a lot of different disciplines. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, the most yeah. conventional would be physics, though. Sure, sure. But again, I guess with any question about when you're thinking about what you want to study, pick something that you enjoy. Yeah, good. You're going to be doing it, so if you're doing it full time, you might as well enjoy it. Exactly. So on that note, I think we will wrap that up then with a nice little discussion about subjects. Okay. Cool. So thank you very much, Matthew, for sticking around for a few more questions. And so thank, welcome. You, thank you to all of the participants who stayed around as well. Yeah, and thank you all so much for coming. It's, it's a pleasure to, to speak for you guys. Mm -hmm.